Welcome to the GCN Tech Show. This week we're discussing what is the best bike that you can buy for a thousand pounds, euros or dollars. We also have hot tech where we've got new wheels, a new Olympic bike, the world's worst e-bike, as well as comments of the week and the bike vault. The world's worst e-bike? Yeah, it's absolutely awful. First up this week, the best bike that you can buy for a grand. Now, we're discussing this because it is a super important price point. You know, a lot of people are looking for bikes around this price, but the good news is you can get a lot of bike for your money. If, yes. If that's what you've got to spend. Um, so let's have a look at some of the options, starting with new bikes. Okay, first. we're going to go new, so theoretically, uh, you've got lots of other things to account for in your price here. Yeah, yeah. and we're also looking at a bit of flexibility in the price point because there are a lot of things, you know, around 900 to sort of 1200 as well. And things are often reduced slightly and you, the price you see is- We're going to discuss price. discounts later on the show though. Yes. Yeah. Um, but w having looked at everything that's for sale from sort of, you know, major brands, you're looking at, say, for example, you know, the Specialized Alley, long been a staple in, yeah. in this in this price point. Um, you're looking at, uh, you know, for a thousand pounds, and I've seen them for a thousand pounds reduced, say eleven hundred dollars or so. You're you're looking at an alloy frame, yeah, carbon fork, pretty much full one hundred and five. Um, one hundred and five for a thousand. Yeah, but mechanical. Oh, okay. And rim brake. <clears throat> yeah. One hundred and five. So the previous gen. Yeah. Um, and that's the several brands that have that sort of thing. Same sort of uh, thing with Trek. Um, the Canyon Endurance AL, uh, I saw that for twelve ninety nine. Four one hundred five rim brake. Same as well. same sort of spec, yeah. Um, and then you know, looking at uh, Decathlon, which you know is a well established place for like good value, yeah. Uh, sort of entry level bikes. A again, looking a bit cheaper, sort of nine hundred quid. I, I saw uh, their Van Riesel for, but it's that same spec, aluminium frame. You know, I also feel like you're at this crossover point where some brands are like rim brakes still, some brands are getting disc brakes. But yeah. I think it's also worthwhile mentioning that there are lots of brands out there that don't even cater for bikes at this price point as well. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. yeah, if you want a Pinarello, and Pinarello clearly target the more sort of top end premium end side of the market. Yeah. The Pinarello F5, which is their like entry level bike, I mean, it's, it's starting at around £5,000 or $6,000. But that is. You're getting a lot of bike that for your money. It's at an that entry point. point into the Pinarello range, not an entry point into cycling. Let's make that clear. But it's no, it's just like Ferrari. <clears throat> yeah, Ferrari don't make a family hatchback, do they? Very true. It's that kind of thing. Anyway, um, but yeah, you raised like an interesting point because different, you know, different sort of specs are available at that price on new bikes. So you can there are disc brake bikes available. Yeah, but you're then seeing compromises in other areas when you're spending a thousand pounds. So you're getting like a much heavier bike and the disc brakes, they might not be hydraulic. I think it's unlikely. A They're like pounds. mechanical yeah. cable actuated discs or sometimes you can see hydraulic discs, but it means then that the rest of the group set is like- You've like, sacrificed it somewhere. It's no longer yeah. 105, yeah. you've dropped several tiers. And so you end up with a much heavier bike and a lot less functionality elsewhere. And you know, maybe the wheels aren't quite good quality and not as good spec. So overall, when looking at all the specs of all the bikes, if it, if it were me and I was buying a new bike, yeah. I'd definitely go rim brake 105 and do that kind of, go down that kind of route. Well, I think if you can get a rim brake 105 bike for a thousand pounds, that's good. But I think they're few and far between, even more so in recent years. They're gradually like a diminishing product, I feel like. They're hard to find in some cases. Yeah, and I think some people are put off the potential of buying something like that because of like the future-proofing of it. Because yeah. they think, oh, rim brakes are dying out. Like, Does that mean I'm gonna be, struggle to get replacement parts or replace my wheels and get some decent rim brake wheels? And I would say, having thought about that, no. Not yet, anyway, that's no. sure. No, like, the, so many people have rim brake uh, wheels, and it's, if there is demand for rim brake yeah. wheels, people will make them. And there are a lot of, yeah, maybe like, you know, the big wheel brands are focusing less and less on on, on rim brake wheels. But 
there, there are loads of people out there, loads of companies out there still making really good rim brake wheels that aren't like ridiculously expensive. Well, I'll tell you what, Elite Wheels, one of our new channel sponsors, also make new rim brake wheels in their various carbon wheels, yeah. which is really cool. Yeah, there's and demand for it. So, do you think we've covered off new stuff? I would say, I'm in agreement with you, I would go aluminium frame and then... I personally wouldn't really be too fussed whether it's rim brake or disc brake. I'd maybe just choose what's most suitable type of rider I'm going to be doing. But the other thing is as well, like, and I said this in a, in a recent video we did with the 500 new 500 views, people have for, seemingly like forgotten how good rim brakes are on like alloy rims. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because everyone was just, you know, a lot of people started using carbon and then comparing carbon clinches with... Carbon rim brakes are just not a great thing for me. Um, no. But aluminium wheels been around for ages and fixed that issue. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about used bikes because I think it gets more interesting when you move away from brand new stuff and start to see like what more you can get for your money. It like oh, opens yeah, up yeah, a whole yeah. new oh, world. It's here. very it's good. <laughs> like used bikes, there yeah. is some like serious deals there. So you know we scoured Facebook Marketplace and also had a look on um, this some, like dedicated used bicycle retailers now like Bicycle. So yeah. I was having a look on there. And there, there are, I mean, you see some, like, ridiculous finds. Oh, there, if, I, I you, think if you're willing to spend fun. the time, yeah, you can find some really good stuff. But as a general sort of trend, yeah, what I, looking at that thousand mark, what I sort of noticed was that it's bikes that are several years old and you, you see a lot of bikes that are carbon frame. And mm -hmm. maybe this, they were like a, like a three grand bike. And now you can get them for a thousand. Like You're looking at like, you know, you see a lot of bikes with like sort of Ultegra spec components on them, and a lot of rim brake bikes as well. There's yeah, still a lot okay. of rim brake bikes in the used market. You're gonna, you still at that price point. There's not as much sort of hydraulic disc brake bikes, good spec. Although you, you can get that, but again, so that's just gonna happen as a natural like product life cycle. Yeah. Though disc brakes are still in the grand scheme of the bike industry, relatively new. So it's going to take time for that to like filter down through the market. Yeah. But you, you should also point out, you know, not, in addition to better components like Voltegra, we're also seeing you're able to get now uh, bikes with like mid-tier carbon frame sets with like aero features on them and, you know, deep section carbon wheels as well. It like opens up a new world for you, basically. It does. I think it's... If I was to have a £1,000 and I wanted to buy a bike I don't think I would be drawn enough to buying a new bike whilst I would understandably like consider it and see what options are available I think I would go use generally yeah, yeah. and the, the also oh, we spotted some like absolute banging deals oh. on, you know if, if they're, they're kind of like outliers within the market but they do exist of things that are say even higher spec, you know, things with like top tier group sets, Jura Ace, and not just a mid tier frame set, like a higher tier frame set that is usually a little bit older. So you're looking more maybe like eight years old to 10 years old, but you can drop on and find something really good. Although there is a risk with the longer, the older the bike, the more chance it's had a Yeah, and it's actually quite a big risk in some cases, especially when you start involving carbon fiber when it's difficult to see if there's a problem with the bike. Like visually, it could look okay, but internally or structurally, it could be like compromised. Yeah, um, I mean, we know what to look for. We're very experienced, but don't worry. If like if you know, I would we'd always recommend trying to buy a bike in person or see it in person yeah. or buy it in a way that you can return it if there's an issue with it. Even if it's used, there are platforms that offer this. Yeah. Um, that sort of buyer security. Uh, but if you're not sure what to look for, don't worry, we've made a video telling you exactly. <laughs> so uh, you're welcome. Um, we'll post a link to it in the description or something. And <laughs> um, there's a couple of other bits we need to touch on here. We mentioned about discounting. Um, so lots of big brands will quite often be seen to heavily discount their products perhaps if they just haven't been able to sell it. Mm. Um, so that's taken into consideration. Um, right now is a good time <clears throat> to buy a bike. We're seeing a lot, yeah. of, a lot of bikes heavily discounted. Yeah, would you say this is like market correction, do you think? P brands can't sell their stuff because people are holding out or the prices are too high, so they're having to discount it? I think some of, in some cases it is, Yeah, but I think it's also a bit more complicated than that. Yeah. Because I think also, while, you know, there... While there, you know, you do see people saying that there's this big global cabal cycling Illuminati <laughs> of which we're part of. Um, 
um, and uh, you know things are far far too expensive. Uh, well, we say are. I do think things are too expensive. Yeah. In in many instances that there are, but I'd say not all instances. Yeah. And I think when you start breaking down the the profit margins of what how it how the industry works in terms and and, and particularly around the lower end. Because say in the UK, the sales tax that we put on all new goods, VAT, it's yeah. called, right? But like value added tax, but they have equivalent sales taxes on in America and in, in other countries. Yeah. And the UK is 20%. Yeah. So on a, on a thousand pound brand new bike, that's 200. That's, well, this is, like is a good a point. a huge chunk of the margin. Okay, so yeah, this I like this, I like this mindset here. 200, 200 pound gone straight away. So what are you yeah. down to 800 pounds? Of the thousand pounds, say like the, the retailer selling. Yeah, thousand pound retail retail price. You're down to eight hundred pounds left because twenty percent of it's gone. Then you've got to factor in the the retailer markup and profit. Understandably, they've got to fund the shop. They've got to pay for all the stuff. They've got to build the bike or prep it all and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Which it depends on brands and stuff like that. But you're probably looking in the region of say thirty percent, sometimes more. So then you're like, well, hold on, half of the value of the bike is gone. So out of my thousand pound retail price, my bike is maybe like under five hundred pounds, and the rest of it is paying for it to go through the process, and get there, and get to the point of sale. Yeah, it feels crazy. And it's like so you know when you see say uh, you know and in some cases we are seeing fifty percent or forty percent reductions on yeah. bikes. That is like at that point they are just literally clearing stock. They're not making any like a, a bike shop is not making any money on that bike now. No, if it's around that price point, like it's just, it's just not like it's it, all that is, is clearing stock because they're sat on stock and they don't want to be forever sat on this old stock. They need to get rid of it so they can get the new. It's like cutting your losses almost. I yeah, guess. it is. Yeah, which is a sad time to see. Um, yeah, well, I think that's kind of cleared up my thoughts on everything really. So, it, right, you're you've got you've got a thousand pounds spending a bike. Yeah, or, oh, or eleven hundred dollars. What are what would you get? Well, kind of along the lines of what I said at the start, I'd almost certainly go aluminium frame yeah. because I think it's just. But whenever, are you going to go used or are you going to go new? Oh, uh, just used, yeah. I'm, I'm going for a used bike because I think I can get more bike for my money. Same. I would go used. Yeah. 100%. All right, there you go. But I can understand the safety of people buying. Well, and, and like, let's be honest. It's just nice to have something that's new. Like, it's yours. It hasn't been used by anyone else. It's not chipped and scuffed, and you, it now belongs to you. Yeah. Let us know your thoughts, <laughs> though, on whether you'd go new or used um, down in the comments, and what you think the best bike is for a thousand pounds. Yeah, I'm intrigued to hear what everyone has to say about this. And mm. um, we can read out the best ones in the show next week. That's the best thing about it. Yeah. Right. Time now for some hot tech. Okay. We're going to kick things off with a new track bike from Dolan. Mm. I believe you know a bit more of the details. About yeah, this bike. so this is a new track bike it's called the DF5. It's a collaboration between Dolan and the um, Aero Performance Consultants, Aero Coach, um, who've helped you know use the CFD uh, studies to, to design it, and it looks incredible. Now it's been certified and okayed by the UCI. It's got a stamp of approval by the UCI. So that it can be used in the Paris Olympics. They're not going to change their mind on it. No, I'm okay. not sure who's, which federations are going to be using it. But um, yeah, keep your eyes peeled for it at the Paris Olympics. But it looks amazing. I mean, the most striking thing when you look at it side on is the, is the rear stays, how they're like really like bladed and really thin and then down in, you know. Oh, it's super low, are they? That's yeah, super low? but yeah. it's like taking advantage of, of the UCI's changed uh, rules in, in frame design. Um, but intriguing, and it's got like the wide fork when you look at it head on. But what is also intriguing is the way in which, say, if you look at the fork blade side on, they're not as wide as they necessarily could be, especially if we compare it to like the new Factor Track bike, which we spoke about, which is like $98,000. It was <laughs> the most expensive dollars. bike ever. Um, and and uh, that, that, a lot of those sort of design features intrigue me. I think. One of the things that um, Aero Coach did mention is that th- that's deliberate with regards to skin friction drag. So they say oh, okay. that when you start, actually, you, you know, any any surface has skin friction on it from the air. So and there's then a trade off. There's a trade off. Oh wow! With making things too deep, apparently. Apparently, so, yeah, interesting. Well, keep your eyes peeled. It also, um, has a rather cool looking new wheel on it. That, that front four spoke, the E stock, that is also been sanctioned for Paris by by the UCI. Oh, Aero Coach's new 
front four spoke track wheel. All right. Do you know what time it is for now? It's time for tool of the week. Not Hank. <laughs> that, that's so mean. When you say that. <laughs> no. That's so mean. <laughs> Hank, yeah. we're really sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry on Ollie's behalf. <laughs> right. Park Tools channel sponsor have just rolled out some new tools. This one I wanted to discuss is the BRK-1, the big rolling kit, which is the ultimate mobile mechanic toolkit. I would, you know, I would love to have one of these. Oh. Even though I'm not a mobile mechanic, I've just got an appreciation for like the real like professional grade tools. You yeah. Things? You think so? This box is, is really good. Okay. It's like a big blue attache case. Yeah, so it's not just about the case, whilst that is obviously it's incredible. Down, it? yeah. um, so it's a tailored selection of around 100 professional grade tools, carefully chosen by Park Tools team of experienced mechanics with a comprehensive offering of all of the tools that you need to adjust, replace, diagnose, and repair the most common components of a bicycle and the box that you're referring to mm. is the BX-3 rolling big blue box with um which is like a professional grade pro mechanics toolbox. It, yeah, it's like yeah, all just in one. I mean if that is I'm actually doing um I'm doing like a custom dream build in a few weeks, just giving this off top secret bit away there. I would love to have one of these toolboxes to like go build the bike. If, uh, uh, is that you asking Park Tool to send you one? <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to send a kit out, yeah. I would be a if I were, If I'm writing a custom uh, Christmas list, <laughs> dream list yeah. at the moment, sorry to give that away, um, <laughs> and, and this would be on it. You've ever been a good boy this year. Yeah. Well, Big, or, or unless you have half a big spender. That would be a very good um, £1,999, uh, no, dollars and 95 cents. So it it is an expensive piece of kit, but this is like professional grade stuff for yeah. mobile mechanics. It's not just a torque wrench yeah. and a chain whip. It's got a lot, there's a lot of tools in yeah. there. Now, if that is a little bit over your um, Christmas price range, I've yeah. got something a bit more budget friendly. <laughs> yeah, what? It's um, an adapter that goes in the Park Tools uh, work stand which basically caters to the fact that lots of modern bikes got D-shaped seat posts. Oh. Rather than like clamping around the edges. Cause yeah. Clamp. Well, I mean, we'll yeah. show a picture of it on screen if people know what we're about. But it's a little wedge that goes in there yeah. that basically yeah, stops. Because anyone that's put a D-shaped seat post in one of the park tool like well, workshops, clamp, stands, to a lot honest. of workshop yeah. stands have the same sort of clamping yeah. mechanism. They just like move around a bit. <laughs> yeah. They don't, yeah. Because they're designed for round. Seven dollars seventy three cents. I feel like you might be getting this for Christmas. I need it in my stuff. life. I need it in my life. <laughs> if I'm a naughty boy, that's what I'm getting for Christmas. Yeah. Cool. Right. Moving on from that, for you being a naughty boy, because that sounds so weird. <laughs> I'm a bad boy. Next up, we've got some new wheels from I'm Elite. excited. Wavy wheels. Yes. Which, they... well, well, I mean, for those unfamiliar with wave wheels, they don't just look cool. The <laughs> the idea behind them is that they're just well, more stable in crosswinds, more high yaw. Um, oh, yeah. Good. So they're called the Drive Helix, and as Ollie said, they feature that undulating wavy profile. But there's far more to these wheels than just that design because they've been completely overhauled, right? So we have got a now a wider external profile for the front rim compared to the back rim, a wider internal rim width. We've got a new wider carbon fiber spokes, a new hub design, a new free hub ratchet design, it's basically all going on with these wheels. Yeah. There's three different versions, of which generally you've got a shallower, slightly shallower front wheel and a deeper one at the back, and then you've got three um, like sets to choose from. Yeah, but they're still using the, the same top-end uh, Toreca carbon, yeah. the same stuff that you find in Pinarellos. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, and carbon spokes, which means that the, well, the 52 to 57 millimeter profile, yeah. um, they're only 12, 80 grams a pair. It is light, that isn't is it? seriously light. I like that. Um, so what I thought was quite interesting was that as you move from the shallower to the deeper wavy profile, mm. the difference between the deep and shallow bits increases more. So the shallower set has got a four mil difference in undulation and the deeper set has got a six mil undulation in difference. Um, new dual star ratchet design as well, where you've got three different plates which work via a new system. So instead of being a spring that pushes it together, as you apply torque through the free hub, it, it engages and bites it in even more, which is yeah. quite, quite, um, quite interesting. And because they're now wider, they're optimized for 28 to 30 millimeter tires, which is kind of like the trend of the industry really. Based on my visit to Pirelli yeah. and everything that they showed me in their labs and their secret testing, <laughs> it's 
it's, I'm convinced it's the way to go. Yeah, I am too. Get some wider tyres, life will be good for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, next up in hot tech, do you want to see my helmet? Oh dear, oh dear. I Why? feel like I'd have no choice. I've got a new bike helmet. It's from Met. It's the um, it's the Manta. Mm. It's their undyed collection, similar to what we were talking about last week with clothing. Is stuff. it in any way connected? The undyed thing. It's not connected in any way, other than it is using like a more natural sort of satin white colour. Mm. I'm not sure this is a natural colour at the back though, but the green bit at the back is what did it for me. It's like. Yeah, Come like on. Egg, eggnog on the back. It's not eggnog in the slightest, it's a, that is cool. Right, let me know in the comments section down below if you think my new bike helmet is cool. If you don't think it's cool, keep your thoughts to yourself. I think that our, uh, well, we've got some GCN ones coming, right? We do, we have a G so custom, custom GCN I think they will design. be cooler. The custom GCN design ones will be better. All right, well, when we get our custom helmets, we'll let you know, but yeah. anyway, um, this sort of undyed collection with the satin white and the lime green, not eggnog, colour at the back it is available across the Trenta, the Manta, which is this one, and the Rivale. I think it's the Rivale, not the Rival. Yeah, um, Rivale, yeah. Yeah. And then finally, we'll move on from talking about my helmet to the uh, to the last thing in hot the, the comment of one of the comments of the week, right, from last week, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this guy saying that when we were talking about Fishnets. <laughs> I laughed that already. Those two turned into Beavis and Butthead. And there you are going, oh, for... I'm talking about a bike carrier, wasn't I? Oh, it? Jesus. Hey, carry on. Hey, great. Hey, carry on. Okay, last in hot tech this week um, is what I, I, I'm calling it the world's worst e bike. Right. Please, if you could just click on the link that I've shared with you to have a look at this piece of equipment. It's engineered and designed to look like a moped. Oh dear, oh dear, actually, that is an abomination. It actually classifies as an e-bike because it's pedal assisted. So it's 1,695 pounds. I saw this on Amazon, but I don't think it's gonna be unique. There's gonna be loads of different ones out that there. That is an abomination. Shay thoughts on it in the comments section down That below. is horrific. Right, 250 watt motor to enable Should we buy it. one? We, if we can buy one, it would be incredible. I think we should. Um, I, that is the worst thing I've ever seen. Oh, we should definitely buy one. Um, yeah, that look, I mean, yeah. Well, so basically, it looks like a moped, but because it meets all of the e-bike regulations, you don't have to insure it, you don't have to tax it, you don't have to have a license, but obviously it can only go like 25k an hour. Do you know what? <laughs> How do you feel about e-bikes that are de-restricted? Because I've seen a few people riding around the mean streets of Bath clearly on de-restricted e-bikes. I nearly ran over one oh. the other day when I was driving because he just came straight out in front of me. Like it's no lights on, and it was going like 30 mile an hour on it. Okay, so for starters, it's breaking the law, so I'm obviously against that. But mm. in terms of a change of concept, I feel frustrated that perhaps the limiting factor for e-bikes as a general concept is the legislation around them, not the mm. technology. So when I was in New York a couple of weeks back, unrestricted e-bikes everywhere and they were just on a throttle they weren't even pedaling them I saw one guy razzing around New York City on an e-bike didn't even have a chain on the bike he just sat there just didn't pedal it and just was razzing around everywhere <laughs> yeah I think de-restricted e-bikes it, it could open like a load of like just carnage mm. but also I think relaxing the regulations or maybe increasing the speed could be a good thing, but I think it's a way more bigger subject than my off-the-cuff answer. Yeah. Yeah. We have another piece of hot tech for you, which came out just after we filmed the show, but I wanted to get it in because um, it's really cool. So there's some updates to Wahoo, Roam, and Bolt computer devices. So this is for the actual, well, the sort of software that's on the device. Uh, you're going to have five new updates on the way with great functionality. So the first thing is uh, workouts are going to be able to be transferred to the device from more third-party platforms from before. Um, so I actually use this for training peaks to put workouts that my coach sets me on there. Super useful. You're also going to be able to control a GoPro from the device as well, um, which 
is really useful if you've got one fitted, say, on the back of your bike, facing backwards, it's harder to to reach. Um, smart light control on there as well. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, music uh, control as well, so you can pause, play, and, and skip music or podcasts or whatever it is that you're listening to. And there's also a dark mode for the screen. So this is kind of just like for greater clarity and adjusting to ambient light and things like that. But um, yeah, really cool, really useful, and good to see that these devices are no longer sort of you buy them and then that's it, that they actually have added hardware built in that's kind of future-proofs them and other features can be unlocked as software develops and things like that. Um, cool. All right, more hot take next week. <laughs> right, it's now time for comments of the week. First up, some comments from underneath last week's show. You want to hear us with the first one? Well, that comment about <laughs> us being beavers and butthead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's from uh, Road ML. Um, so yeah, we'll flash that up. But the next one's from Mark Bradshaw, 4960, who says, that titanium bottle, which is the new titanium bottle from yeah. Camelback, um, is the icing on the cake for a titanium bike. Expensive, yes. But you'll uh, not need to replace it for decades. So it's a win. I'm going to put a couple of those titanium bottles aside when I do my dream build in a few weeks. It's going to look absolutely boss. Anyway, moving on. From underneath your visit to Pinarello HQ, where you picked up your cool new bike, um, Constantine says, the lady seeing the camera and turning around at 1420 is absolute gold. So we'll play that clip. Yeah. <laughs> and then another comment says, Hank goes on a date in his GZN kit. Ollie sleeps in his GCN t-shirt. Talk about dedication to your job. That is you. Yeah. The GCN pyjama range is available soon, isn't it? And then underneath our saddles video. Available from shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Underneath our saddles video, um, one comment that says, we don't actually sit on our sit bones. And they say, exactly. Thanks for saying this. I'm so tired of this myth. Nobody except commuters is actually sitting on their sit bones when they sit bolt upright. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's an interesting point to raise. Yeah. And uh, Crowchan, Crowchan says, unpadded saddles. <laughs> Uh, is giving me childhood flashbacks. I'm sure anyone else who was a child in the 80s at some point had or knew someone with a Rally BMX burner with a hard plastic saddle. Yeah, but that's the thing, right? Like, that's what we spoke about in the video was that, like, you don't need to have padding on a saddle provided you've got the correct, like, padding in your bib shorts. Like, yeah. It, it, well, I've, I've always from. said it, it's, it's the most important thing with regards yeah. to saddle comfort is, is the profile and the shape of it. Yeah. Okay, right, it's now time for the Bike Vault, which is one of my best parts of the show. This week is extra special because Ollie's new bike is in the Bike Vault. Is it? Oh. And we, Here we go. are going to judge it. All oh, right, of course you are. Right, so. Come on then. Come on. Ollie's what, new what, bike. What possible reason have you found not to give this a super nice? It's like computing in my brain. Yeah, come on then. Two points from here we go. Mate. Right, come on, give me point your point number one. The pedal is not actually level, which I commented on your Instagram post. They never sit level. It's a speed play. You could make it level. We tried hard enough. Number two, what with some blue tack. Yeah. Number two, and I feel like we pick up a lot when people do this. Right. Your what? bike's leaning against the wall. Admittedly, I'm assuming on you did it carefully on the handlebar. Yeah, but there's a on risk. The bar tape. There's a risk. No. That's, that's absolute rubbish. <laughs> what we talk about is where people lay like a carbon component, like the frame against like an object where then the bike can move and the frame scratches or rubs. There's absolutely zero damage that's happening to that bike against the wall. Bikes against the wall, absolutely fine if it's done on like soft finishes, like the tire or the, 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 rim, the, the bar tape. Finished? Yes, it's absolutely, absolutely fine. That's within the rules. It's a nice from me. Boris next absolutely with uh, Eddie Max Lavender 68. Oh, that's a stitch up. That is, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Uh, no, it is cool, mate. I, I like it. It's good. <laughs> that's the pity ring. Oh, I don't want a pity <laughs> ring. Right. Oh. So the Eddie Merck's next. What are we um, it's back in into sensible bike vault mode here? Yeah. Yeah. Brown saddle, brown bar tape, tan wall tyres. It's not in the big ring, but... Nice. Nice. Yeah, I will yeah. let that slide, but all right. Uh, Nuno with a 1988 Peugeot, or Peugeot, <laughs> if you're a Philistine, um, Monaco uh, in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. What do you make of this? Uh, I like it. This, um, 
I do like retro bikes like this. Something to be said said about them. It's actually I fairly similar was about to, to, to Hank Road. I was, well, yeah, it is. It's very nice. Mm. Uh, classic. I, I was about to give this a nice on account of it being at a jaunty angle, but then I realised that's just the poor civil engineering on show in the Netherlands. <laughs> What's propping the bike up, stopping it rolling, rolling away? A little stick at the back. I think the bike is on a... On, on flat ground. I think it's just a, a, a wonky wall. Oh, it's great like this. Mm. <laughs> right, come on. Uh, I would like to give this a super nice. Because I, I, I do I'm as well. appreciate it. No, that is super nice. Super nice. <laughs> Next Andre. is Andre with a Trek 1200 location in the middle of Germany. Oh. Uh, it's our last bike vault for this week. Fluoro in colour gets a yes from me. Not in the correct gear. What do you make of the bricks? <laughs> the bricks are not doing it. The brick me. stand. No. Shadow stands available from shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Uh, bricks are available from your local builder's merchant. But they look rubbish. Um, what? I, this bike has got a lot of potential. Again, it's an era and style of bike, which I really appreciate. But it's poorly presented. The, the current gear combination that's going on there. Nope. Nope. No. Andre, I'm going to say it's just a nice from me. But Do you know what else is weird on that, that Andre's got wrong in the middle of Germany, is the the, the bars are, like, angled down. Yeah, it's retro. No, but, like, they're not even for, like, they're not, like, they're yeah, really okay, yeah, they're angled yeah, down. Maybe. Well, if you would, it would be great if you could resubmit this into the bike vault with better preparation, because I would like to rejudge it. I mean, it's a good photo, there's good depth of field, but it's not quite like, mm. the bike really pops, it's yellow, and it, it really does pop in the frame. Yeah. We can see it clearly, but it's not, you're at a weird angle there. You're not... Go on, yeah. show your thoughts, show your thoughts. Nah, nice. Nice, all right, that means we're ending on a nice... Um, this week's show has been fantastic. I've had a great time. Have I you? did until we got to the bike vault. <laughs> that was the best bit for me. <laughs> um, please do get involved in the comments section down below. We've actually discussed lots of really interesting stuff this week. Mm. Like new bikes, e-bike regulations. How do you slide that in the middle of the show? I want to buy that e-bike. <laughs> right, yeah. we're out of it. Ollie's going to buy an e-bike. See you later, bye. <laughs>